Stanford University. Welcome to Stanford Medicine's 10th Annual Contemplation by Design Summit. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, the founder and director of Contemplation by Design. I'm honored to introduce our next teacher, Kodo Conlon. Kodo will be speaking to us about Becoming Radiance, Six Practices for Selflessness and Compassionate Action. Kodo Conlon has practiced Buddhist meditation for nearly 20 years. He trains in both the Zen and Theravada traditions, ordaining as a Soto Zen priest in 2015. A participant in the 2021 to 2025 Insight Meditation Center teacher training, Kodo's extended residential practice has included over a year cumulatively in silent retreat. He serves as a practice leader at San Francisco Zen Center and as guiding teacher for the Young Urban Zen Group. Kodo's teaching emphasizes a joyful, comprehensive freedom of the heart, liberation, available through the Buddhist path. Join me now in warmly welcoming Kodo. Thank you so much, Tia, and thank you everyone for being here. Becoming Radiance. So does a healthy sense of self come into conflict with the Buddhist teaching on not self? In other words, does my spiritual practice negate my agency? If there's no self, how am I meant to navigate the needs of my life with competence and with confidence? These are some versions of the questions that I've been invited to address. So my colleague May Elliott in her talk, The Bodhisattva with Boundaries, spoke of the paradox of not self and the healthy mature sense of self, examining the tension between selfless generosity, what we might call yes practice, and healthy boundaries, no practice. We understand interpersonal boundaries as a necessary condition for navigating modern life that um, is too often set aside by spiritual practitioners at the risk of real harm. Yet we see how boundaries, our conventional perspective, understood in this Buddhist language as the world of form, these are in fact far from in conflict with the teachings of emptiness, not self. So to refresh on just a few key points in May's talk. From the perspective of form, that is uh, the view that includes concepts, that includes conventions, we should all develop a mature, stable, confident, healthy sense of self. From the perspective of emptiness, not self, we see there isn't a separate fixed entity called me. Rather, emptiness sees that there's a flow of experience. Now our task is to hold both form and emptiness together. The teachings on form tell us that we need to tend to our boundaries and care for our unique individual selves. Teachings on emptiness tell us that we're not merely an individual me, that beneath the idea or the concept of me, what I call me is more like an ever-changing river of experience. Now, the more deeply I can see that I am not fixed, that there's no core entity, the more I can see that I'm always changing, the less tightly I need to cling to the fixed sense of self. Now, since this can be a pretty challenging topic, I'll spend some time addressing the paradox of not self and mature self from some different angles than May did. Then after setting the foundation, I'll, I'll discuss these six practices for becoming radiance, the six perfections. We'll pick up the thread with practice, that is specifically how in the Zen tradition in which I lived as a monk for eight years, we go about cultivating the wisdom and compassion to navigate this seeming paradox, not self and healthy self, emptiness and form. May prepared us for this by showing that our boundaries are not anathema to Zen Buddhist practice. 
but rather that form and emptiness are one. So first, let's talk about what Zen might relate to as a healthy sense of self. This example comes from the early Buddhist tradition and is the inspiration for the talk, the title of the talk, Becoming Radiance. Now, this is a story from the, the early Pali suttas. You can imagine the scene might be um, in, the, in the woods. A monk is meditating alone, and the story begins. When it was evening, the venerable Sariputta rose from meditation and went to the Buddha. After paying respects, he sat down to one side. The Buddha then said to him, Sariputta, your faculties are clear. The color of your skin is pure and radiant. What abiding, what meditation do you often dwell in now? And Sariputta responds, now I often abide in emptiness. And the Buddha enthusiastically praises this response. I see, I see some inspiring detail in this encounter that an intimacy with emptiness that Sariputta has been practicing, it gives rise in him to a clarity and a radiance that's so clear that the Buddha could see it with his own eyes. By abiding in emptiness, venerable Sariputta had become radiant. So our first step in understanding and undertaking a Zen approach to becoming radiance, to learning to abide in emptiness, is to clarify a common misconception about not-self. The prolific scholar and dedicated practitioner, Venerable Analio, offers a crystal clear explanation. His account of not-self points precisely to the relationship that May discussed yesterday between form and emptiness. So here's a summary of how Venerable Analio puts this. He says that the, the teaching of not-self becomes misunderstood as nothingness, and that this is a misapprehension. Not-self can be understood instead in this way, that in this body and mind, there's no permanent entity here. There's not one in complete control. One small example is that despite my wishes, this body will age and soon enough pass away. There's no permanent entity and nothing in complete control. We must understand that when the Buddha is discussing not-self, he's doing so in conversation with the ancient Indian notions of not-self, which may be a little different than we hear them. So the question is, is there no me? <laughs> is uh, what's here is not a permanent entity, but what continues, Venerable Analio teaches, is that a, is a process of causes and conditions. This process, it's not nothing. In the process of causes and conditions, there is a continuity. And I have a responsibility because of that. Let's say, for example, that a few minutes ago, I said something hurtful. The me of right now is responsible. I can't simply say, oh, no self, no self, wasn't me, no one here. There's a continuity, and I'm responsible for those words. So in his teaching, begins this continuing flow of causes and conditions to a river. It's flowing, changing. No essence, but a continuity. And to paraphrase a second example, from modern physics, we know that what we take to be solid matter is largely empty space. This desk, mostly space. First, this doesn't mean that I can just walk through it. It may be mostly empty space, but I can still set my computer on it. We can say or understand that it's mostly empty, but it's functional. And then second, I could say, cut this desk up into little pieces until it's dust and not find the essence or the core, the lasting entity called desk. And this demonstrates just what we mean when we discuss the desk's emptiness of essence. It is a matter of causes and condition. So this is the teaching of not self, it's both emptiness and conditionality. Two sides, one coin. 
these two aspects he sums up so nicely in this one phrase the apparent voidness of emptiness is filled to the brim with causes and conditions the apparent voidness of emptiness is filled to the brim with causes and conditions. Now, this understanding shines a very different light on our apprehensions about the Buddhist teachings of the not self. We see that in this being, there's no essence, but a continuity. So the question may arise, will practicing in accord with not self teachings render me powerless? Certainly not. If so, then every Buddhist master over the last 25 centuries, I'm going to say playfully, would have been a passive lump, getting nothing done. Let's briefly turn to an example to see how some qualities of a healthy sense of self in modern psychology align with those of someone deeply mature in the view of not self. So first, a couple of the popular conceptions, the prevalent ideas of what's included in a healthy sense of self. They're pretty well documented. Things like authentic communication, confidence and the uh, capacity to set goals and work toward them, uh, the capability to set boundaries, and the knowledge of one's opinions. So to say again, some of the questions as I, as I sometimes receive them regarding this practice of not-self, am I never supposed to have opinions? Is the Buddha's teaching asking me to always simply allow and never respond and never to do? What about when I'm being harmed or someone I care about is being harmed? Where do boundaries come in? Should I not set and work toward goals? So these are all valid concerns by sincere practitioners navigating this confluence of not self and healthy sense of self. So we can take a cue from what follows. And I'll say this is a clear and powerful description of actually the Buddha himself, this being that has a penetrating insight into not self and also has a very strong sense of self. This comes from a piece published by Joy Manet, a PhD in Buddhist psychology. She writes this, and I'll quote it in its entirety because this passage is so strong. She says, at a recent conference whose theme was the psychology of awakening, Buddhism, science, and psychotherapy, many of the participants expressed their confusion regarding how the Buddha could function in the world without a self. Because they were Buddhists, they were trying to follow the teaching and to achieve or to imitate what they imagined this form of functioning could be. I thought they had missed the point, she writes. What the texts show in the character of the Buddha is someone with a very advanced self-concept. His self-esteem is perfect. He's gone beyond doubt. He knows and he is confident of his knowledge. He expresses himself with conviction. When the Buddha talks of himself in the first person, he does so with clarity. He has a strong sense of identity and knows very well who he is. He gives accounts of his life experiences in the first person. He gives accounts of his spiritual capacities in the first person. For example, he announces and proclaims that he is a Buddha and says what a Buddha is. He gives first person accounts of the capacities required of him by society. He insists he is a competent debater. He discusses at ease and in full equality with kings and other notables. He defends himself and his teaching against unjust accusations and false representations. It's clear that the Buddha's self as this concept is understood in contemporary psychology and psychotherapy, namely a clear sense of identity, the ability to function competently and realistically in the world, to have a standard of ethics, to achieve one's goals, to interact with people, to make good choices and so forth was fully functional and remarkably well-developed, as one would expect. She concludes saying, neither psychotherapy nor meditation is possible unless the sense of identity or ego is mature and well-grounded. Otherwise, there's nothing to change and nothing to go beyond. Well, <laughs> so my comment here is that what we see in the Buddha is someone who has fully realized emptiness and lives powerfully in the world. This, this very world of form, 
this world of society, decision, expression, of thinking, of power, of debate, confidence, and self-esteem. He is shown to be powerfully functional, and he knows not self and emptiness to their depths. So both Sariputta and the Buddha embody in this world the visible radiance of emptiness. And this brings our conversation straight to Zen. We might say that maturity in Zen training, maturity in Zen practice, is the complete integration of form and emptiness. And the mastery to move between them seamlessly. For example, this could mean presenting powerfully when the moment calls, or letting go of notions of a self when this is the appropriate skillful response. Zen maturity, we could say, is like fluency in the river of conditions. A fluency that clearly knows in the river there's no lasting entity and clearly knows that the river is a flow of causes and conditions. So we're pointed toward this task of fluent integration by an ancient Zen story. Teacher Keizan, considered one of the two founders of the Soto School in Japan, is with his student Gasan Joseki. This is recounted in a Zen anthology called The Timeless Spring. Gasan is characterized as being a, a young and bright person. He apparently has a bright face. Kazan encountered him, spotted him as one of uh, potential skill and strength in Zen practice, and he took on the responsibility of training this young person. He helped Gasan to refine his wisdom and compassion. And after many encounters and long training together, there's the story of this occasion. If you happen to see the full moon last night, then this, uh, this story might resonate all the more. One night as Kazan was enjoying the moon along with Gasan, he said, do you know that there are two moons? Gasan said, no. Kazan, the teacher, responded, if you don't know that there are two moons, you cannot be a seedling in this succession. To summarize, in other words, to point the way and encourage his student Gasan, Kazan taught that if you don't know both form and emptiness, that he couldn't be a successor in the lineage. He was encouraging him to really understand form and emptiness. Such is the importance of not neglecting either perspective, actually, the ultimate, the conventional, emptiness and form, wisdom and compassion. So the Soto Zen lineage is said to pass on this integrated understanding of form and emptiness from warm hand to warm hand, person to person. And I'll say with the radiance of two moons, many, many teachings point to the emptiness side, the Diamond Sutra and its famous closing stand, stanza, likening all experience to a dewdrop or a bubble, or the world of form expressed through teachings like the five degrees where we meet face to face in a changing world, somehow with never injuring emptiness. So with this phrase, the radiance of two moons, we have a sense of where we're headed, a way of being that is strong and flexible, wise and compassionate, one that integrates form and emptiness. So how do we develop this? So do, to do precisely this, in Zen practice, we've inherited this way of training in six perfections, six paramitas. They're all practice on a basis of compassion. The rest of this talk is dedicated to these six practices with an emphasis on how each of us can practice them and how these six incline us to the full integration of form and emptiness. I'll share what each of these six perfections is and then offer some tools for developing that perfection all the way discussing how the practice is mature and understanding of both form and emptiness of mature self and not self. In this way, the hope is that you'll learn a specific path of practices that can help you navigate this paradox. 
the ground, the first thing to know about the practice of the paramitas, the perfections, is that Zen practice is cultivated on the basis of compassion for oneself and all beings. I like to illustrate this by describing how we do not enter the monastery for training. It does not begin this way. You come, you come into the monastery gate, someone, someone greets you, says, welcome to the monastery, here's your room, here's the schedule. By the way, there's no self, believe this now. <laughs> Rather, we initiate a process of compassion, of integration into the community, into a space of safety, first in the meditation hall, safe enough to bring forward the trust and the space needed for our defenses to come down and our heart to grow up. In his book on the practice of these perfections, senior Dharma teacher Tenshin Rev Anderson Roshi, in a section called Zen is Great Compassion, points out this curious fact that you won't notice the word compassion in most famous Zen stories. However, he underlines that compassion is the ground of wisdom. And he explains, in many of the traditional Zen stories, the students bring their practice of compassion to a teacher, and the teacher responds in such a way as to help them become free of any impurities in their compassion. So back to our example of Kazan asking his student Gasan, do you know that there are two moons? This is Kazan asking, is your wisdom and compassion mature? Can you see and live the radiance of mature self and not self? Can you see and live the radiance of these two moons? The aspiration of Zen practice on the basis of great compassion is to realize unsurpassed, complete, and perfect awakening, to deeply realize not self for the welfare of all living beings. Looking closely at this, it's an expression, the pinnacle of integration of wisdom and compassion, of form and emptiness. At the beginning, in the middle, and the end of Zen path of the six perfections, the welfare of all living beings is of central importance. Realizing not self in this Zen practice, one never graduates from the practice of compassion. As expressed by Tenshin Roshi, whose work I'll be drawing on quite a bit for this discussion of the perfections. Most of the ongoing open-ended work of the Zen Bodhisattva is kindness and compassion in the form of the first five paramitas. Wisdom, emptiness, not self, is the final touch on the masterpiece of great compassion. So on this basis of compassion, let's turn directly to the six practices, the paramitas. Paramita is a Sanskrit word, means going beyond. One understanding of going beyond, practicing the paramitas, we're practicing the qualities of an awakened heart that's intimate with emptiness. That is, if we want to realize emptiness, we practice the qualities that partake of emptiness, those qualities that constitute the view of emptiness and that arise in a heart and a mind that's intimate with it. Dharma teacher Gil Fransdahl, published in this uh, journal by Zen, uh, San Francisco Zen Center, celebrating its 50th anniversary, wrote that as Zen teaches, Practice and realization are one. Peace is realized in being peaceful. Compassion is realized in being compassionate. I like to say that emptiness calls to us through the qualities we practice. So these are the six. Dana, giving, generosity, Sila, ethical conduct. Vishanti, patience. Fourth is virya, energy, heroic effort. Fifth, dhyana, meditation, concentration. And six, prajna, wisdom. 
I'd like to get into discussing these practices by first calling to mind their opposites. The six opposites of the perfections would be something like stinginess, harmful conduct, impatience, uh, sloth or maybe laziness, a scattered attention, and the opposite of wisdom would be ignorance. So it's intuitive, I think, just upon hearing these, how practicing these six opposites of the perfections hinders our effectiveness and skillfulness and occludes our compassion, our healthy sense of self. In fact, they hinder how we function in the world of form. Practicing the opposites of the perfection, perfections also hinders our ability to realize emptiness. It's a bit like fogging up our glasses or smearing mud on our windshield. In such a condition, it's pretty difficult to see something subtle. So traditionally, the paramitas are practiced in order. We can grasp why when we reflect on the fact that actually many, 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 many people come to these practices initially through meditation, which is the fifth perfection. And, they, and many people encounter a good deal of difficulty distraction, agitation, foggy faculties, confusion, confusion about the practice without a clear path forward. And from the perspective of the practice of the paramitas, I would say, yes, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. From the view of this, this set of practices, we set in place the foundation of a house before we raise the rafters. On this basis of compassion, we begin with giving ethical conduct with patience, proceed to energy, and then we move to meditation and wisdom. We put the foundation in place for a practice that's integrated, one that's wise and compassionate. Now I'll go through these paramitas one by one. The first, dana, generosity, giving, graciousness. Attention, Roshi puts it, giving is the warm heart of Zen practice. Generosity attends and responds with kindness to whatever turns up. I'll say that Dana Paramita, it's versatile in that it applies to our practices both on and off the meditation cushion. On the cushion, we might remember that Suzuki Roshi, the founder of San Francisco Zen Center, taught that of Zazen, Zen meditation, we should be not only attentive to each breath, but we should be kind to each breath, generous with each breath, gracious with each breath. And then off the cushion, the practice of being gracious with all that arises, with people, with things, with states, pleasant, unpleasant experience. And I want to underline what I'm about to say, gracious even with our lack of graciousness and generosity. Can we give room to our lack of graciousness and generosity as the true for now arising of this moment? So as aspects of the Zen practice of Dana Paramita, this giving and graciousness and generosity, there are three common divisions in the practice. One is the giving the gift of material things. Two is giving the gift of fearlessness. And three is giving the gift of the teaching, giving the gift of Dharma. Giving the gift of material things, pretty intuitive to us, I think. Consider this a concrete offering that we can make with an attitude of uh, graciousness, with two hands, or nowadays with two clicks. Tenshin Roshi, again, tells this simple story of his practice, and I love this, his challenges with material giving. This is someone who's dedicated decades to Buddhist practice, and um, we can just see how human we are. So here's Tenshin Roshi's story. Once somebody gave me a beautiful new automatic pencil. When I came home, I showed it to my wife, and I said, look at the nice automatic pencil that was given to me. She said, can I have it? And I said, no. <laughs> I wasn't ready to welcome her request and give her the pencil. But I did welcome that I wasn't ready. 
I felt stingy and embarrassed, and I accepted that I, I, uh, that I felt that way. I thought, here's this wonderful person who's been so kind to you, and I'm not ready to give her a pencil. Silly me. How embarrassing. But I didn't beat myself up by being stingy toward my stinginess, which would have temporarily blocked the perfection of giving. I had a good night's sleep. The next morning when I got up, the pencil came to mind again, and by that time, I was ready to give it to her. So I did. By accepting my unreadiness and my embarrassment, I became ready. Hmm. The second aspect of this practice of giving, giving the gift of fearlessness. I'll say that we offer the gift of fearlessness when we commit ourselves to non-harming. We compassionately practice for the benefit of all beings, and we dedicate ourselves as best we can to doing no harm. Being around, I find, others who are devoted as far as possible to harmlessness, there's something interesting that I sense, and that is I sense the possibility of safety. I sense their own fearlessness. And this quality that comes through that I, I like to call the confidence of a loving heart. What a gift, this gift of fearlessness. And then third, the gift of Dharma. I think the Buddha is a great ex exemplar of this, of course, in terms of his formal teaching, but also in terms of his attitude. We've been talking about this graciousness. And it's interesting to note that in the, of course, in the early days of the Buddhist teaching, it did not happen in training centers. There were no such thing as meditation centers, the temples as we have them in the United States. They were personal encounters. And by, by his uh, openness and graciousness, the Buddha was able to turn all places into places of practice. So this for me is, is one of the lessons of dana paramita, of giving, of graciousness, that maybe all of us can enact. That is, by my own graciousness, how can I make all places sacred? Can I render every encounter a blessing and a place of learning, even a center of training, wisdom, and compassion? This, of course, is done through our actions, not just formal teaching. So giving can be a joyful practice. It can even be rather exuberant. It feels good. It feels good to give. Have you, had, have you had this experience? The joy of giving is counted among the blameless pleasures of Buddhist practice. So the form side of the practice of giving is clear, but how does this prepare the mind to realize emptiness? From the perspective of form and a healthy sense of self, Dana Paramita helps us connect with others. It expands our view beyond the narrowness of self-criticism, pride, self-concern. Dana Paramita nourishes a healthy social environment and enacts the dharmic practice of community. And then from the perspective of emptiness, giving is a direct antidote to the influences of clinging and of craving and aversion. These influences that encumber clear perception, including the clear perception of emptiness. If I look through the lenses of always of what's in it for me, it's very difficult to perceive the conditional contingent nature of my own life, let alone that of others. Through the practice of giving, we clear obstacles to realizing the empty conditional nature of our experience and the selflessness of all beings and of the profundity of our shared life. Such is the potential of such a simple practice So directly, Dana Paramita, the practice of giving, mirrors awakening. May discussed how a full realization of emptiness prepares us to be generous in a boundless and selfless way. And in researching Dana Paramita, we actually find that there's a type of giving at the beginning of Buddhist practice and a type of giving at the end of Buddhist practice. There's a beginning in the world of form represented by Dana that we've been talking about. And its close companion, 
Hati Nisaga. It's a giving that's associated the the giving over uh, of the inclination of the mind to full freedom. The giving over of the mind that, that is right on the verge of fully realizing emptiness. But giving at the start, giving at the end, giving in form, giving in emptiness. So as we continue through the rest of the paramitas, you might note how each of the practices cultivates both aspects. Practice of form, healthy sense of self, personal strength, and emptiness. How it does this simultaneously? The radiance of both of these moons shines through all the practices. So this was the first paramita generosity. The second is sila, ethical discipline. In a phrase, this is acting in ways that do no harm. Again, consider the opposites. We can reflect how acting for the harm of others creates a sort of internal static, or in uh, far cases, how cruelty, the impulse to cruelty binds and darkens the heart, or how ignoring the actions that benefit others and instead choosing those that harm, in a sense, covers over our eyes and gives rise to delusion. Reflecting on the opposites, we can see how if we're aiming toward radiance, um, we can understand how acting for the harm of others is actually going in the opposite direction. And why Zen, Zen training and Zen practice puts so much emphasis on Sila Paramita. Now this, this practice entails a good deal of work. And the abbot of Green Dragon Temple uh, Julia Richman Beiler says that after the exuberance and joy of Dana Paramita, Sila Paramita, ethical discipline, he characterizes as the downer Paramita, the Paramita of stop it. <laughs> uh, I appreciate his levity with such a serious topic. But for, for many reasons, the perfection of ethical conduct is really worth the work. For one, there's a subtle empowerment that comes with virtue. As it's said in the Dhammapada, the scent of jasmine, rose bay, water lily, don't go against the wind. But the scent of virtue does travel against the wind. It pervades in all directions. So to be meticulous with one sila paramita is a time-honored practice. Uh, to repeat a quote that May offered last night, Padma Sambhava, though my view is as vast as space, my attention to conduct is as fine as barley flour. Now in Zen practice, ethical conduct, Sila Paramita is expressed as the 16 Bodhisattva precepts, characterized sometimes as the ethical responsibility of Zen practitioners to realize unsurpassed, complete, perfect awakening for the welfare of all beings. So it, they recognize the fact that we practice together with all beings and our commitment to ethics supports us in taking on these weighty practices. The practice of Zen precepts sometimes includes a formal public ceremony for this purpose. It's helpful to have a community of support. So the 16 Bodhisattva precepts include First, the three refuges and the three pure precepts. But I'll focus tonight, given the time that we have, on just the last 10, known as the 10 major precepts. These are have sometimes playfully been called the rubber meets the road precepts. <laughs> so these are the these are the trainings, not the commands, but the trainings of not killing, not taking what isn't giving, given not harming through our sexuality. And then there are a number of them dedicated to speech, not using false speech, slanderous or divisive speech, not intoxicating, not being avaricious, not harboring ill will, and not disparaging the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So all these knots of the 10 major precepts may give the impression that training in Sila Paramita is somber business. As Suzuki Roshi would say, not always so. 
These precepts are trainings, trainings, they're not commands. And we resolve, we do our best, we observe, and we learn. Not somber business necessarily. Practicing Sila Paramita actually is quite empowering. And I see this in the way that we reclaim the power from the forces of greed, hatred, and delusion, reclaiming it for generosity, compassion, and wisdom. We give that power to goodness, and we're empowered thereby. To take just one brief example, consider the practice of refraining from false speech. The practice communicated positively of communicating truthfully, communicating truth. The power that comes through communicating the truth is that our word becomes trustworthy. Our word becomes authoritative. People trust our word, and so do we. The radiance of an ethical heart is profoundly joyful. Uh, this is called in the early tradition, the bliss of blamelessness. It's the delight of a heart that is giving fearlessness to others that knows that it has not done any intentional harm. So how does Sila Paramita prepare the mind to realize emptiness? Again, emptiness calls to us through these practices. On the form side, we receive and make these ethical commitments. We practice them, giving the gift of fearlessness to others. This aspect of a healthy sense of self it's clear about one's own ethical commitments, how one aims to walk in the world, and it enjoys this bliss of blamelessness. On the emptiness side, to paraphrase Tenshin Roshi, from the perspective of the awakened mind, the mind of the Buddha, let's say, it wouldn't even occur to one to harm by way of unskillful action or opposites of the precepts. This would be like the left hand steal from right. Now it's our practice to integrate the, these ethical practices gradually, just these perfectly imperfect beings that we are. Committing to a radiant ethical practice, we are called to awakening by way of our every action, and we are gradually ennobled through this perfectly imperfect practice of the precepts. It includes compassion, a compassionate recognition of when and how we may fall short. But we continue to respect our sila and our vision clears. And up grows generosity, up comes the gift of safety, up comes compassion, up comes confidence that comes with a mature heart. And they support the stillness that can realize emptiness and then enact that with emptiness in the world. So we've covered the first and the second paramita, generosity and sila. The next two I like to, re I like to think about as a pair. They are patience and energy. First, a little bit about patience, a short story. When I was training at Tassajara Zen Mountain Center, the monastery near Big Sur, there was this very experienced monk who uh, took on the role of Tassahara director. Um, and she had this really good idea to have a giant thermos that she would fill at a hot water station and then carry back to her office so she could have tea throughout the day and only need to go once a day. Why did she do this? Because carrying her big thermos, only 25 yards to the samovar to get water and 25 yards back often took an hour. The requests were so many, often she would be stopped every few steps, and a person would have a request or a question, something would come up that needed discussion. What was so remarkable is that she seemed to have an endless well of patience and presence. Whenever I was one of these monks that would come up and, and ask a question to her, uh, she seemed to have no no hint of hurry, no hint of, oh, I really should be getting on right now. Actually, it, what I received was, this is the most important thing that's happening, is this encounter right now. 
It really left a big impression on me. In contrast, in my own in my own monastic training, similar situations with my own share of temple administrative responsibilities stacking high. I have memories of treading through public spaces visibly with the attitude, I'm late, I'm bonkers, I have to go now. Can anyone relate to this? So soon enough, it became clear to me that this was a state of suffering and that I had some work to do. So um, Tenshin Roshi, again, characterizes Kishanti Paramita, the perfection of patience like so. And as you're hearing this, you might listen and recognize just how broad the scope of patience is. He says, patience is the ability to sit calmly in the center of all suffering. Patience is not waiting for painful circumstances to go away. It's not attempting to control our experience. Patience is not trying to get away from physical and emotional discomfort, and it is not wallowing in them. Training in patience encourages us to be wholeheartedly present with whatever comes and goes. And we will need great patience in order to enter the practices of heroic effort, concentration, and wisdom. This is really striking to me to be wholeheartedly present with whatever comes and goes. I think of our thoughts and feelings or events, all of our experiences, our possessions, our jobs, our homes, our loved ones. And to cultivate and nourish a response that can be wholeheartedly present and free with the inevitable alteration and ceasing of everything in experience. As I say this, I recognize just how heroic the mature practice of patience can be. And perhaps as a guiding question, for each of us, when is it challenging to practice patience? In what contexts? In what states of mind? Right there is where we learn. So Shanti Deva, who's the author of one of the ancient manuals on the practice of the Paramitas, here it names the challenge to the practice of patience and the stakes. He puts it this way in some ancient language where he says, there's no vice like hatred and there's no austerity like patience. Therefore, one should earnestly cultivate patience in various ways. The mind does not find peace, nor does it enjoy pleasure and joy, nor does it find sleep or fortitude when the thorn of hatred dwells in the heart. And I've paraphrased and consolidated a number of Shantideva's recommendations for developing patience. One is start where it's easy. Much like starting, starting at the gym with the light weights and building your way up to the big ones, Shantideva recommends uh, habituation with the uncomfortable, small than big, as a training. So one of the ways to do this is to attend to what is unpleasant but bearable for a set period of time, maybe even a short period of time. Start small. For me, this looks like, because I have uh, sensitive ears that often get uncomfortable, it's the hum of the refrigerator comes up, it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, but it's bearable. And I study in myself, uh, this is uncomfortable, this is my response. And little by little, little by little, cultivating patience. So with all these little pop-up annoyances that may, may come, come to your mind, the notion is to train and in not indulging them by piling on extra anger to the discomfort. Shantideva's second recommendation is to leverage cause and effect. In short, remove the fuel that feeds anger. He puts it this way, that when fire spreads from one burning house to another, one should bundle up the straw and the like, take it out and discard it. Now to, to leverage cause and effect, this asks of us to become students of our impatience, anger, ill will, discomfort. And then third, nourish wholesome alternatives. One of them, to rejoice in the good qualities of others. Another one of these blameless joys. And one of the functions of this is we take the energy that would have gone into feeding anger, let's say, and we give it 
to something beautiful, something skillful, something wholesome. In the tradition, this is called replacing the peg. In Zen practice, we cultivate patience by sitting zazen, sitting meditation, sitting upright with whatever arises. And this is hard. <laughs> we were just talking about sitting with uh, little discomforts. This is a great place to do that. To sit with the resolve and say for X number of minutes, I'm not going to get up. Whatever thoughts, moods, sensations, notifications, I'm going to stay. The training is that our commitment is deeper than pleasant feeling and unpleasant feeling. And mature patience can grow. It's said in the Dhammapada, as a solid mass of rock is not moved by the wind, so a sage is unmoved by praise and blame. So I said these work as a pair, patience and energy. The fourth paramita is virya, energy, heroic effort. Now, when practicing virya paramita, we might see them as diligent, dignified, determined, without clinging. We can look at the practice of energy, of course, again, in the everyday world, and we can look at it in meditation practice. In the everyday world, we got a great discussion about this last night, the energy it takes to set healthy boundaries. This is Virya Paramita. This is the, the perfection of energy and heroic effort. There's a, another story of my time at San Francisco Zen Center. As background, the role of president at San Francisco Zen Center is enormous. It's like the ultimate administrative responsibility for three temples, for the structure supporting 100 residents or more, hundreds of members presiding over the board, guiding differing personalities, by far more demands and requests that one can respond to. So when my Zen teacher, Linda Gallion, became the SFCC president, she got some really good advice from the then central abbot, Ed Sadazan. He, in his own right, had trained with Suzuki Roshi and then had a long career in uh, the tech industry. So he knew something about managing his time. His advice, one simple sentence. To Linda, he said, the number one resource that you have to manage is your own time. This is Virya Paramita. This takes real work. Tension Roshi, again, gives us some caution about overwork and gives us an encouragement, saying we can rest heroically. One might imagine a life immersed in Buddhism to be all meditation and silence. Not always so. <laughs> it also includes these boundaries, Virya Paramita. So to focus on right effort and meditation, our effort works in an integrated way with mindfulness. We train in knowing where and how to apply right effort. The key to Virya Paramita is learning how to tune to the appropriate level of energy. The classic analogy given in the text is that the Buddha encounters a, a monk who's a former musician. And in conversation, the monk talks about, I know I've been, I've been practicing and practicing. Why isn't my meditation working? And the Buddha offers a metaphor, that of tuning lute strings. Your energy can't be too tight and it can't be too loose. Your energy needs to be in tune. So in, a, in addition to the tuning of energy, simply knowing that we can cultivate energy is at the heart of Virya Paramita. Hmm. So these practices of giving, practice of shila, practice of patience, practice of energy. Prepare us, prepare the heart, prepare the mind to enter the fifth and the sixth paramitas, which we can also regard as a pair. The fifth is dhyana paramita, concentration, meditation. Of course, in this Zen tradition we've been talking about, dhyana paramita is rooted in compassion and dedicated to the welfare of all beings. The how of Dhyanaparamita in this tradition will be instructions that 
probably sound familiar to most all of us. Sitting still, letting go of discursive thought. And once tranquil enough to contemplate the teachings and the nature of things as they're arising in the moment. In Suzuki Roshi's teaching, Dhyana Paramita, the practice of meditation, lets everything come as it comes and lets everything go as it goes. In our meditation, we allow a wide vision that includes everything. And to jump straight into this uh, wide vision can easily pile confusion upon confusion. So it's customary, customary to settle the mind on a steady focus like the breath or the body. What I'd like to emphasize about Dhyana Paramita is that the attitude is important. The practice is fruitful not by applying the mind like a vice, <laughs> but by steady effort over time and two little skills, connecting with what's here and then sustaining that attention. This Dhyana Paramita, it takes an investment of time. As Natalie Goldberg put it, Beethoven practiced too. <laughs> uh, can't get around needing to practice. So the last of these paramitas, prajna, wisdom. Shantideva, who wrote that ancient manual on the practice of the paramitas, in his opening chapter, there uh, opens the chapter on the perfection of wisdom, highlighting its importance saying the Buddha taught the entire system for the sake of wisdom. Following, following the teachings of Tenshin Roshi, there's this whole set of wisdom teachings in the Zen tradition. Just a, a whole variety. Something they have in common is that they're intended for a mind that's receptive, silent, and still. Wisdom in stillness is something that's dynamic. And the sages have said that words won't reach perfect wisdom. They think we can aim in that direction with what we've said, to know that this body-mind is not a static, fixed thing, but a continuity of conditions. By cultivating all of the paramitas, and I'll highlight this, by cultivating all of the paramitas, we learn and we feel and we sense our way into the perfect wisdom of emptiness. As uh, Sojin Mel Weitzman, one of the former abbots of San Francisco Zen Center taught, there are a lot of obstacles in Zen practice, especially in sitting. You sit meditation there and you cross your legs and you don't move, he says. Then you have to find out how to stay there. You can't figure it out. Eventually, you find the place that cannot be disturbed. Hmm. Sojin's encouragement. The wise ones of the past didn't leave us without any hints, thankfully. A lot of this wisdom of the tradition is held in the, the teaching stories, the family stories, uh, discussing things like the family treasure. And many of them emphasize how it doesn't come from out there. It's not something from outside of us. Hmm. With, with giving, with Sheila, with patience, with energy, with meditation. Something deep and beautiful grows up in us and gives radiance to, a, to our faculties, radiance, radiance to our actions in the world, our speech, the way we are, how we carry ourselves. We become radiance through these simple practices. In conclusion, just a few brief summary points about the perfections. So this, uh, this practice directly addresses our question about mature self and not self. That full maturity in Zen practice recognizes both and integrates them. Interestingly, paramita practice circles back on itself, strengthening and maturing what came before. Our practice of giving can be purified all the way along, purified by wisdom, meditation, energy, patience. And then it begins again strengthened again. I'd like to leave you with a final image. At uh, SFZC City Center, there's this beautiful, enormous piece 
of calligraphy uh, canvas done by Kaz Tanahashi, this huge colorful circle that's not quite closed. It's a slightly open circle. It's so striking. The circle is called an enso. It's a common symbol in Zen. I call this to mind to consider that the practice of the perfections, it never comes to a close. It continues endlessly. With a mature view of emptiness, compassion is strengthened and doesn't forsake beings. And we deliberately, powerfully, considerately, with agency, act in the world for the benefit of ourselves and the benefit of others. This is our vow. My one last encouragement, the path may be quite a long path, but please don't wait for goodness. Please don't postpone goodness, but bring benevolence into the world right now by way of your thoughts, your speech, and your action. By way of the paramitas, don't postpone goodness. Thank you very much. Odo, thank you very much for your teachings and your lived experience that is the ground from which you teach. I'm going to begin with a first question, and that is about the word heroically. You used it both in talking about energy and, and then you also offered, we can rest heroically. If you would just help us understand the word heroic. Oh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'm following um, Tenshin Roshi here and using the word heroic. Uh, it has some it has some linguistic roots, but more to the heart. For me, the word heroic, I think it represents the fact that the, from the view of Zen practice, all beings are noble. All beings carry this innate dignity. Um, and to say that we are heroic when resting <laughs> and we're heroic when applying our energy incorporates the entire spectrum of human action and honors the fact, oh, this is, a, this is a dignified whole being. That's how I hear heroic. Thank you. The second question is in response to the quote you shared in which it was stated that uh, or the spirit of the quote was that both uh, Buddhism and psychotherapy honor the uh, importance of a healthy self. And as I heard the quote, there was a place for potential confusion, and that is whether the healthy self needs to exist prior to the commencement of psychotherapy and Buddhist training, or whether psychotherapy and Buddhist practice and training can help to form the healthy self. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Um, as I reflect on how that quote was written, it sounds that it sounds that way, like it's you have to do with the one and then the other. I'm so glad uh, we get to qualify that now, because um, the my own experience and the lived experience of being with practitioners deeply involved in the Buddhist world, these two go together. These two very often go together. Um, one of maybe the lesser known lesser known facts about buddhist teachers is they're strongly recommended to also be in conversation with a therapist to be in the care of a therapist so there's buddhist practice and therapy going on at the same time if you're thinking about the beginnings of practice i'm again reflecting on my own time and that of others i've seen i've seen these dovetail in a really beautiful way where the entry to zen practice might be some some um coming to recognize how well or uh how not well we recognize and relate to our own emotional life and so it be, it becomes it becomes one of the basic tasks to uh develop that that part of ourselves i see i see them as very helpful to each other 
uh, psychotherapy and Zen practice. I don't think you, you have to do one and then the other. And taking this one layer further, if one is finding that there's an absence of healthy self, the quote almost implied that there had to be a healthy self before you start either therapy uh -huh. or Zen practice. Yeah, I I think I think what we're pointing to is a it's a it's a reasonable qualification. the The quote was written in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, I'll say mm -hmm. that um, uh, if I'm remembering the language, it the the way that I the way that I heard it was that for the for the full potential of those practices to happen a mature sense of self needs to be part mm -hmm. that may or may not be what the author intended mm -hmm. um but i i think uh i think it's important to, yes to address this address this twice that um a healthy sense of self absolutely should be part of the practices and that's that's really the the whole thrust of what May and I have hoped to talk about these uh, last several sessions. Um, you have elevated that. Not bear with me as I am just speaking to questions that may be among the participants, and that is that when struggling with the absence of a healthy um, sense of self, that uh -huh. the Zen teachings will be a resource that. Um, that help to cultivate a healthy sense of self that right there the healthy sense of self is not a prerequisite mm -hmm. oh yes the, I, I think you're i think you're saying it and you were too i'm just putting it into perhaps um accessible terminology for someone who may not be as deeply rooted in buddhist practice or may have never done psychotherapy great 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 I think maybe a, a capping statement I can I can put on this is the one of the functions of the the five paramitas is to to cultivate these inner resources that we relate to as a healthy sense of self that um, it can certainly be a response to say a lack of a healthy sense of self and then this can be a direct antidote in the in the form of Zen practice. Thank you, Kodo. Moving to a different question. An individual asks, can you say something about the form side or aspect of meditation and wisdom? Can I say something about the form side of meditation and wisdom? Sure, sure. They're so deeply, the form and emptiness side of meditation and wisdom is so integrated, so deeply integrated. Um, but one of the ways that we can talk about the form side of meditation, let's say, in the context of Zen practice, is that uh, there are specific forms that we take up. And what I mean by that, um, there's specific practices for that we engage with the body. So we, we come to our meditation cushion in a specific way. We move around the hall in a specific way. Uh, and we take our, take our meditation seat in a in a prescribed way it's a it's an expression in the world of form of the sort of harmony that's about about to be possible through through zen meditation the form side of wisdom that that is, is this interesting bit where perfect wisdom when it when it comes to when it comes to its fruition expresses itself through the activities of the paramitas that we described with an extra qualification it recognizes that when i'm uh when i'm interacting when i'm interacting with a being i know the extent to which that being is permanent or not permanent <laughs> i can't read their thoughts that's not the that's not the engagement but my my heart and my conduct, my speech and my thoughts, they 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 interact enriched with the wisdom that's arisen. So the form the form side of wisdom, I'll say, is the conduct infused with wisdom. 
Does that does that make sense? Very clarifying. Thank you. And there's one more question, if I may. It asks if you could just on the most basic level illuminate the difference between Zen meditation and insight meditation. Yes, this is a this is a big question. Um, I'll try to limit myself to just a couple of couple of statements here. Um, I'd like to start actually with what they have in common in the way that we teach them. Oh, I should qualify it and say, um, Zen meditation is many, many things to many, many lineages. And insight meditation is many, many things to many, many lineages. So I, I'm just speaking from the two that I've trained in. First is the thing they have in common, which is a strong emphasis on the body. They both emphasize becoming embodied with the, with the support of a really concrete focus, like the breath, or like uh, the, the felt sense of the body. One of the places where they differ in emphasis, and this, this varies depending on the, the lineage you're talking about, one of the places they differ is that the path of insight meditation for a very, very long time down the path emphasizes the objects of attention, sight, sound, smells, taste, touch, the things we're, the things we're familiar with practicing mindfulness. One of the differences in Zen meditation as, it's train, as we train in it in, um, in our lineage is that once, once the, the body and the mind are stable enough, we let go of any effort directing toward one thing or another. And then uh, something quite beautiful emerges, which is the flavor of awareness, the flavor of awareness itself. And there's this, there's this emph emphasis on getting to know the knowing itself that comes out. I don't know how clear that is in brief. I think that could be a, a, a great topic for another hour. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Thank you for even stepping toward the question and we'll invite you at another time to answer it when you have more time to do so. Thank you, Kodo. Thank you so much, Tia. Thank you, everyone. Such a joy.